Happy New Year and welcome to our 2023 season of Coffee and Technology. We're excited to continue bringing you new episodes with a year of more special guests. This year's kickoff looks into the future of IoT and collecting brew data in cafes. Let's get the year going. All right. So, so then, Norbert, what is the Internet of Things? What is IoT? Oh, <laughs> IoT. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> um, IoT is a fairly recent um, the, the definition or development. Uh, so the last, it really started when the internet became more available and devices became more connected. So first we, of course, connected computers and thought like, well, that's great. We can communicate with each other, right? There was email, there was uh, um, internet uh, relay chats and uh, and there was all, all those those devices and and, and services. Um, and then suddenly, of course, people thought like, what What if we connect other things? So every every tool we use in our lives. And one of those ideas uh, I became aware early on, and I think which which was was big in the media was like the the connected fridge. It's like, why would I want to connect my fridge with the internet or my washing machine or my dryer or my um? And it's still, I think, is this is this big question why but let's go back to the to the how and uh and the how is well each device be, is basically um turned into a small computer mm -hmm. and that small computer connects to the internet and connects to a database and connects to services so depending on what it is uh you can remotely tell that device what to do um or that device can uh get better data from the cloud um, and it all starts very, fairly simple. So mm -hmm. the, 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 I think the most useful thing is always if there's a device which already has a microchip and a computer in there, let's take a fridge or let's take a, let's take a washing machine. Like a washing machine, they have so many programs depending mm -hmm. on you know, what you put in there and what time and, what, and how sold it is and all those, those interesting yeah. things. So there's already a program running and as we know, software is never perfect. So there can be a bug, there can be a problem. But mm -hmm. also over time, you might learn how to make those those machines better. Mm -hmm. With the mm -hmm. same hardware, with the same motor, the same equipment, but you would know, well, if, if I add a new software, I, it could do better things. So having an internet-connected machine allows you to update to the latest version. Mm. And that that alone is is already very very useful. But then you can do a lot more things, like like car manufacturers do, or like any other like same as the fridge. Mm -hmm. Manufacturers learn how people actually use those devices by generating data. Before that wasn't possible, right? They would they would uh, do user studies. They mm -hmm. would ask you how do you how do you use your fridge? How often do you open your fridge a day? And you would say. Well, I guess maybe 15 times. Like, when do you open your fridge? Uh, I don't know. I'm in the morning, for lunch, for the evening. Who, who knows, right? Yeah. And those are all best best guesses. And now they have the real data. They know when you open the fridge, what you do with it, how long does it stay open? Do you do you take water from from the dispenser? Or it it might seem very small, but really that data makes and can make the product much better mm -hmm. yeah. knowing what the user is actually using it for and how, uh, or, you know, knowing that, I don't know, 20% leave their door open, uh, the, the fridge door open. So that means, oh, we, there needs to be an alarm. There needs to be something yeah. which, or that door is not working well. Yeah. Why yeah. would they leave it open? Nobody likes to do that, but if it doesn't close well, there's a problem, right? Yeah. So you yeah. can learn from all those things. And the more complex the device gets, the more uh, opportunity there is. Yeah. Like like a car. So yeah. cars are already super electric, electronic. Uh, you mo Most problems are not found by someone uh, taking out a few screws, but actually connecting um, a computer and, and read the error codes. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I feel like all that data also like that people don't sometimes think about is also has to do with like improving longevity of a product, and this relates probably to like coffee. Coffee, for example, is like 
longevity and like understanding usage of a product to help for maintenance, for example, like understanding which, if you go back to the fridge, like how many times a day is the door opening? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if someone's saying 20, but really they're opening it up 40 times a day, well, it helps them understand like, okay, after a while, this door is not going to open the same way as it used to. And helps the manufacturer know then too, it's like, what can we do to improve and extend the longevity or, or make parts or hardware um, more durable or, or whatever it means. So I feel like there's that aspect of it as well that that goes both ways. Right. And and I think that's, I mean, what to do with data is always in the hands of the, the, the people who, who deal with the data. And mm. you can either optimize uh, to basically make that thing break after exactly 2,000 uses. And that's what the warranty says. Mm-hmm. Or you would say, no, I want to build something which is better and lasting longer. Um, and there's, of course, also uh, jurisdiction. So it, they, there's, there's, there's different movements now where, especially in the European Union, <clears throat> certain things need to be maintainable and, and repairable, mm-hmm. um, which, again, I think the last 30 years were quite terrible in that yeah. development, but it's yeah. changing now towards... Uh, Things can need to last longer, need to be better, uh, and also consumers, um, I think, are willing to pay for that. Yeah, and th- I think that's that's another thing. So I mean, ultimately, also also companies need to understand how to um, how to price things, right? If you if you produce a washing machine which just lasts for hundred years, it might be very hard to do that for a very long time. Now, if you produce a washing machine which lasts very long, but also has the spare parts available and a and a and a meaningful maintenance schedule, yeah. uh, which makes it last you hundred years, but still generates some revenue and generates some um, some interaction with the with the manufacturer, it can yeah. it's more sustainable for everybody. Mm. So, and that's that's uh, that's basically keeping those spare parts out um, and and one. One of those things is, especially washing machines, right? It's super, super, super horrible. It breaks down. It takes you a while until you get hold of someone who can tell you, who can even look at it. Yeah. Look at it and say, like, no, this is actually broken and it makes no sense anymore. Then it takes a while until you get a new one. Mm-hmm. So what do you do in that, in that period of time? Nobody likes to be without a washing machine. And... That is only if you talk about homes where you can maybe go to a neighbor or a friend or a family member or, so, or something, right? You yeah. you figure it out. For businesses, that's, that's even more impactful. Yeah. And now let's go go to our to our espresso machine. Yeah. If that espresso machine breaks today, until the service technician comes out, until the part is ordered, until everything is fixed, you might lose a week or two of productive. I mean, of not making espressos, basically. It's a big chunk of revenue loss, for sure. That's a huge revenue loss. And beyond that is also a huge um, repetition uh, a repetition loss where you, you know, people would, would come in, be disappointed. It's like, mm. I wanted an espresso. Well, I don't get it today. Mm. And then you're okay. basically turned away. So you're not only paying for something you would like, or not paying for something you would like to pay, but you also... Uh, turned off and it's like, well, who knows when it comes back? I go to a different place, and in those, in that week or two, you might just establish a new habit and just be fine with that other new place. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is, it's not, it's not like a, a washing machine where, yeah, well, you you figure it out, you you find a way around. Those machines should work all the time, need to work all the time. Yeah. So what do you do with those devices? Same with like cars where you absolutely need to rely on a car to get from A to B for transportation companies for there's so many examples where machines cannot break down. Yeah. So you do pre- preemptive maintenance, right? And preemptive maintenance means just you on a schedule and you change those tires and you change the pump and you change those washers and you change whatever things which might break, mm-hmm. you change them before it happens. Mm-hmm. But they might be still totally good, and they might still have fifty percent of life in them, or maybe more. But since you don't want to take that risk, uh, there's a lot of um, waste by yeah. uh, by 
by just just doing it on the schedule versus doing it uh, smart. And and that's the that's I think that's the era, that's the new that's the new thing we can really do with IoT. Mm. Since the devices are connected, we can learn more. Okay. We can accumulate more data. Uh, and that data leads to us understanding better what the machine needs. Mm -hmm. So if pressure is lagging or or um, not not at the at the same level as it was before, so there are certain patterns you can see over time, and that can that can lead and leads to uh, a thing called uh, predictive maintenance. Mm. So instead of preemptive, where you just do it because you think it will happen to predictive because you know it will happen and you know when it will happen mm -hmm. always this is not perfect it's it will uh, but it can be substantially more precise than uh just doing it on a schedule which you think works yeah because yeah. who, who who know who really knows right you always yeah. go off um examples here or there uh but you you kind of it's very hard to, to understand the big picture yeah, like having all components, all all the data at that point, you only yeah. know oh that machine broke yesterday, and then you can ask the owner or someone who's like how did how did you use it? Why did it happen? And it's like well I don't know, it just broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. You know, so one time one thing you mentioned in a previous conversation, um, outside of one of the episodes that I thought was interesting was, and I was hoping you could talk about this experience as well and how this relates to maybe the cafe experience, but when you started roast, there was a lot of data that that a lot of roasters were starting to pull that they didn't realize they needed. And then mm -hmm. when when that data came, it was like, oh wow, where was all where where was this this whole time? And I'm wondering yeah. if like what what that could look like on in the in the cafe space as well with with new IoT machines and sensors and just more data to be collected now in the cafe. Yeah. I think it relates to that seeing the full picture and not just parts of it. Mm. And uh, and then suddenly you realize how beautiful and how interesting and how complex that picture is. So what, what happened in Roast, um, with Cropster to Roast, we started to connect roasting machines mm -hmm. to temperature sensors or I put temperature sensors in, or if they had one, we connected those sensors with, with the computer. Mm -hmm. And the computer would then put the put that information to the cloud. So we kind of made the roasting machine an IoT device without really being an IoT device because you still need a computer and and certain you know uh, apparatus to to get it get that done. Uh, but yes, the data was available. So once we started to connect collect more data, um, we could start correlating. And say, well, this is the roast. It is a certain type of roasting machine. This is a certain type of coffee. This is a certain type of uh, uh, ambience. Uh, this is so all all different uh, pieces of information. Mm -hmm. um, and not only on an anecdotal level, where and I've seen it a lot, and I admire that quite a bit when people were writing a lot of the information to their notebooks. Mm. So, so a lot of roasters who took their job very, very serious 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they would just make a lot of notes. So they knew there's something in the data, right? So they could yeah. go back and revisit and, and, and look at it. <clears throat> but still, it is very hard for, for a human to compare so many data points and also keep them all in, the, in, in our brains at the same time. Mm hmm so while you can see certain maybe developments or dynamics, maybe you can you you can learn from it for sure. Having all the data consistently in one database allows you for a much better data interpretation, mm. and and of course a better a better analysis. And that really led to to those to to that new picture, like mm -hmm. seeing everything. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was then the feedback basically, and and we only started with like a simple roast curve, and then we added so many more data points. Yeah. So now you really have to, and if I think there will be even more in the future, but the the, the picture is already pretty complete. Mm -hmm. 
and what 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 he said was exactly that. So Rosas came back and said, "Oh my God, I had no idea how all this was related, or why did I miss that?" And it's like, well, it's it's not your fault. It's just we are not made for interpreting millions of data points in our brains, mm -hmm. right? And but computers can do that fairly easy, and and we have of course the data science scientists who help us with with all that mm -hmm. the task. And so also it's not a, a it's not an easy task, but it's it's totally doable and it's state of the art. Mm -hmm. And with that concept of hey, we would like to show you the world from a little bit of different perspective, or we would like to show you the full picture, we now approach um, the coffee house, right? So the, mm -hmm. the espresso machines, where it's like this machine can be smart, we can capture a lot more data than is available, and over time, we will really understand much better how that machine actually works. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what we what we kind of felt or what we saw this happening is it either really happening or it kind of is happening and there is something some small piece we might might have missed which now uh, allows us to fully dial things in consistently and and uh, and 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 all the, basically all the time so it's not a today I kind of got it right but tomorrow I missed a little bit and I'm a little bit off yeah. Yeah. Enjoying this episode of the Coffee and Technology Podcast? This podcast would not be possible without the support of Cropster. Whether it's tracking harvest yields, roastery and inventory management, or simply tracking brew recipes, Cropster Origin, Cropster Roast, and Cropster Cafe can help you streamline your workflows and help you operate more efficiently. With all of this, so, so you mentioned one thing that kind of I always think about, and this is something more than just coffee, but when you say how our brains can't probably handle a lot of these data points, which is so true because it becomes a mess and it's not clear the way a computer can create tables and digest and filter out different data points and just manage all that. Um, that makes me think like, okay, computers can do a lot of great things. And while we can get into the subject of like where, where computers start to take over in a lot of areas and that becomes kind of scary, if we specifically keep it, if we specifically keep it on coffee and on the retail, the cafe, the cafe side, like where with all that, let's just say brew data specifically being collected, where does it become like our responsibility to, um, to responsibly use and create tools that, that to keep the human, the, the barista focused, the, the barista first in the cafe and yeah. not not allow automation to take over the human side of it. If, I mean, whether our world is going that way or not, I don't know, but it's always a question. That's, I a, have. that's a very interesting question, a very broad one. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what do we really want or also the, what do we pretend? And I think it, it really depends what, uh, what the goal is of a certain coffee house concept. If their goal is outstanding customer service and outstanding products, um, then there's, I think there's always a human element there, mm. um, which it's just humans like to interact with humans. Humans are okay with also talking to machines and taking uh, certain things out of a machine. I think it's fine for, for convenience and for, it also depends on how smart that machine is. I mean, I'm, I'm there's, there's, there's pretty good uh, coffee makers out there who yeah. are fully automated. You just put in some coffee and maybe give it a little bit more information about that coffee. And then it brews you a very good cup. Sounds great. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's not possible. That's definitely possible. And the more data there is, the, the more possible it is. But it's not... I mean, I always come from that. Why, why should we... F There's so much fear out there. Like, whoa, computers will take over. Well, they already do in so many ways, mm -hmm. and they are really ha helping us, making our lives more enjoyable, making our jobs easier. Um, you know, when when cars drive um, and there's less accidents, I would love that. Yeah. Right? Or if there, if if uh, I really truly believe in at some point, not only the driving but really the whole traffic control will be like like the air traffic control, right? There's, mm. a, there's this one central authority, which makes it, I just was, was reading a little bit about the Atlanta airport, right? It's like almost 3000 flights a day. 
yeah, someone needs to coordinate that. Yeah. So those planes come safely in a, I think they land every 15 to 30 seconds. So it is, it is a, it's a, it's a thing of precision of putting all those planes into the correct loops so that they can touch down or leave at exactly the time and the second they are scheduled to. So oh. yeah, there is more traffic on I-80 going from Sacramento to San Francisco, uh, substantially more cars, but the concept could be the same, yeah. right? A central authority, which just predicts all the cars entering, all the cars leaving the highway, uh, if there is an interruption, if there's a, a, a construction site or something, slowing everybody down, um, or even like you schedule your 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 I mean, you usually schedule your departure time, right? It's like, oh, mm -hmm. I leave at 8 to be there at 10. But what mm -hmm. about if you could really reliably put something into your car's computer or into your phone and say, I want to be there by 10. You put the alarm, you let me know when I have to leave. Yeah. Depending on today's traffic and on the prediction for the next two hours. Yeah. And I think we can save a lot of time and a lot of nerve and uh, a lot of sorrow yeah, love money by by doing that. So I think again, that was a very long way of saying computers can be very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think bring it back to the like to the espresso machine. It is that is that that consistent experience. Yeah, customer like to have a consistent coffee. Customers like when you, they try something exciting and new. Do not necessarily be the guinea pig, and then it's a hit or miss if that new is good or not. Mm -hmm. I think that good can be good from mm -hmm. the start if it's well treated and if there's more information. So I think that's that's this this element of let the machine help us to be a little bit better, mm -hmm. uh, but also let us figure out as as a on the barista side, mm -hmm. the barista connects to the to the customer. The barista mm -hmm. sees that that person and the person says, hey, I, you know, I really want a very strong coffee. Or, hey, today I feel so adventurous. I want something exciting. And I truly believe that depending on how you brew a certain coffee, it can be very strong or it can be very exciting or it can be just the average coffee everybody else gets. Mm -hmm. So dialing the machine towards or, or, or get creating the product the customer needs in that moment, I think that's next level, right? And I, I, how to figure that out? Uh, well, only if there's a, there's an interaction. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes compared with like uh, me going into a bar or into a, into a restaurant, and then there's this wine list. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm just not a wine drinker or connoisseur. And it, it overwhelms me. It's like, what should I do here? The only yeah. thing I can do is I can read the description and I can look at the price and then okay. maybe where it, where, where it comes from, right? So it's like, well, I want something exotic from New Zealand or from who knows? Austria. <laughs> oh, even more exotic. Yes, Austria, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, if I want to feel a little bit more home, then I can do that. But yeah, yeah. I have a little bit more reference. I wouldn't even know the region <clears throat> and where it's produced and, and so on. Yeah. Um, but there, you know, there's those places where the waiter or the, the, you know, whoever helps you out comes and, and actually just tells you exciting stories. Like, hey, you know, I have, if you want to look at the wine list, it's fine if you feel comfortable. But I kind of also tell you, I have those three things. Uh, they're fantastic right now. Hey, if you want to try this, that, if you feel more adventurous, if you feel more conservative, if you feel, and I feel, oh my God, this is so nice. Yeah, right? yeah. Someone taking care of me. Yeah. Maybe I don't, I just don't want to look at the list. I, I just, want to be served and I want to be in someone's hands who actually knows. Yeah. yeah. So the barista can do exactly the same thing. And that's, that's what I feel like happens in, in those really fantastic coffee shops. They just ask you or they feel the vibe. It's like how you, how you come across and, and it's like, maybe this is for you or give you suggestions or just listen to you. It's like, what, what is he, what is he, what does he want today? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. And I feel like also on the flip side too, it's, you know, <clears throat> it also helps not just 
like all this brew data, for example, like it doesn't just help the barista. It, it can also help, you know, like management, for example, like train and educate baristas to be better baristas. Um, you know, like uh, I'll have some context, you know, coffee goes through a lot of, a lot of moving, a lot of different hands, a lot of months of travel, and it goes through a lot of work. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, baristas can't pull a perfect shot every time. But if there's that kind of ability to kind of see, start to mitigate and try to limit, limit the inconsistencies in, 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 in brewing coffee, um, it helps present more coffees even to the customer more to the customer the more the way it should be presented more and more um yeah. and i feel like only brew data can really help you get can help the industry get there if that makes sense absolutely and i think it's a, it's a usual responsibility right you are at the at this the last second yeah of making it happen all the the, the coffee traveled so far and uh, you know starting at the farm where big care over days and months and years was taken and then yeah. all the transportation process and the roasting, as we know, is complex. And and then you have those really fantastic beans. And if you have to throw away a lot to dial it in, that already is a crime. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, it's 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 a it's a loss. It's a yeah. it's a huge cost. Yes, exactly. So now if you if you buy a really exciting and top notch and and very expensive auction lot, you don't want to spend half of it dialing it in. No. And having having data having information systems helping you with that i think is is to everybody's benefit yeah um and as you say i mean the, the barista like to learn they like to uh know where they stand yeah and yeah. It, they can do it either with the book right writing things down and 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 memorizing and i think a lot of them are very very good at that so i i wouldn't take that credit away but i think computers can really add that extra Mm -hmm. extra level to yeah. to that yeah, yeah. and uh, that's the same with the with roasting um you should focus in the moment of what's going on and not on like oh my god i need to count the seconds or uh what's the pressure right now or what is the computers can do that for you yeah there's so yeah. much more going on um so you you can focus on what's right in front of you and we yeah. have to interact accordingly so yeah 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 and then and then again look at the data get the get the get the notes get the hints get information presented in a digestible and, and meaningful way learn from it yeah and improve <clears throat> yeah it's true you know i just thought of something right now um <clears throat> that we, we may not have the answer in this for a while but um it makes me think it's like you know we have all this connectability and ability to, to pull data from like machines and understand about and, and focus on the coffees. But one thing I really think about now is it'd be really cool if there was a way to start to track, I don't know how we would track as to what this would look like, but certain data points where we could help the, the improve the physical part of being a barista or the physical part of being like a roaster, for example, like all that, all that time, putting putting in taking out the portafilter, filter tamping like that does eventually take wear and tear on your wrists for example mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i know that's something that's some, something that some industry professionals are, are discussing a little bit more mm -hmm. but if we if there was a way to like start to i don't know somewhere pull different like movements that the barista is doing like it'd be interesting because like not only are we focusing on now the coffees we're also focusing on on the person and helping the actual barista like you know, take care of themselves. Right. And I think that's, uh, that's a super important area. Uh, so not necessarily something we, uh, from a software perspective can come in right away. Right. So yeah. it, it requires uh, the hardware implementation of something which was done manually yeah. into something which can, which a machine can do. Yeah. So that that is a lot of uh, engineering. That's a lot of figuring out. I mean, there is automated tempers. It's not that's not exist that doesn't exist. But how good are they? Are they good mm -hmm. enough? Are they flexible enough? What what is the surrounding um, environment? How, what needs to be integrated? Yeah. Um, and how much will that machine cost? And will people pay for it? 
yeah, or yeah, rather yeah. have someone else doing it manually because it's not that big deal. Yeah, yeah. well, it's a big deal, right? So that's that. That I think that is the question for. Like the espresso machine is a little bit different because you need high pressure. Yeah, uh, it is. It is just the way it was designed was not to replace a person's. Uh, well, it, a little bit, right? You you could also do the the pressure manually, and there's those manual espresso machines where you apply pressure with yeah. your hand. Um, but even those, like you can hook up with systems and and see if you do it consistently. So yeah, there's a little bit of that replacement. Yeah, but not not a not a whole lot, I would say. Yeah. Um, with pour over is a little bit different, right? So we we see or we saw quite a number of uh, automated pour over machines. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm still the manual guy, right? I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, in same. my kitchen on my Harry V60 and uh, <laughs> pour pour water over the grounds, and uh, um, I like it because I do this maybe twice or three times a day. Yeah, it's it's just three minutes or five minutes of getting away from work or just you know take taking a little bit of time. So yeah. I, I think it's nice. Yeah, yeah. But boy, did I did I look up I don't know how many websites and and all those Kickstarter projects of like, hey, this is this automated pour yeah, over yeah, and yeah. we can do it smarter and we could do it better and we can I think it's highly exciting. Mm -hmm. So I would say for environments where you don't want to do that manual work, it's perfect. There's great options. There's great yeah. options out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Dang. Well, yeah. the more we get into this, the more I realize how much data can be collected that I think we still haven't even scratched the surface in the industry. There's so much things we can be tracking. Yeah. <laughs> whether and, whether and it's I good or not, you know? The, yeah, well, I think it's either good or not. And that that's something I, I also would like to touch on a little bit. Because <clears throat> um, there is a lot of fear and a lot of like, why do we need this? I think there should always be a purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to collect data to understand certain things a little bit better, but you should be able to state an as an an estimated outcome before mm -hmm. you start collecting. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's like well, you collect for the sake of collecting, and it's a little bit of gambling. Mm -hmm. Which, um, I, I, as I said, it might be okay to uh, to some extent because sometimes we really just don't know, and mm -hmm. we once we have data, we can learn a little bit more. Um, but a good starting point in general is always you have an intention. Mm. Like we want to make coffee roasting more consistent. We want to make brewing more consistent. We want to make machine maintenance uh, more affordable uh, uh, and and more more consistent. Uh, we want to save the environment so many so many thrown away pieces uh, over time. And so there's there's all those intentions. Yeah, and I think data can help help with that. And then, and the other part is like who manages the data? What is mm -hmm. the what is the policies? Who touches the data? How secure are the systems? Those are not light questions. Yeah. And whoever you work with, whoever manages your data or you connect your machines to, should give you meaningful, understandable answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's that is. It's not, it's not easy because, of course, you have legal contracts in yeah. play, which are legal is always a little bit more complicated, but it's always a, I would say it boils down to a simple who owns the data. That that can always be spilled out fairly easy. Who is involved in data? And there's all kinds of levels, like uh, the whoever owns the machine owns the data, mm -hmm. period. The other, the other company might help with managing it and and learning from it but they don't own it or it's a shared ownership great maybe that's fair enough that's also good yeah. or it's basically it only the company who manages the data owns it well then you also know that's more like the you know some, some other models yeah in the, in the industry and maybe it's fine as long as you know yeah and then the third is like whoever owns it sells it to anybody who wants it yeah and that's that's also has has impact. So, so knowing some of those those questions, I think is not unimportant. Or asking the asking them before you get into any contracts, yeah. Or before you connect the machine, and also, um, hey, is it possible to shut it off? 
but mm. there's nothing wrong with shutting off your machine when you're not when it's not in in service when you're yeah. not in the shop uh, shut down your wi-fi i think that's that should be always a an option yeah um so you also know there is a there's a time or a or, a, or where, where the machine is not connected if yeah. you, if you feel like that's what you want yeah yeah again you need you you should know what the implications are some machines are then hard to reconnect or yeah, I, yeah and of course. just making this up i don't yeah, know yeah, but yeah. <laughs> um but no, I mean, what for, I, what for, I, some, I, for some services, it makes sense. It's always that is always connected. Also yeah. for for safety or security reasons. Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, but I mean, I think what I get out of that is, you know, a few things. It's like, what's the goal of all this data, and who owns the data, and how are you, how do you have more control over your own data? Like those are the three big things I think out yeah. of that is like some of the most important things. So. I like and that. What's your, yeah, and what's your benefit, right? If you yeah. if you feel like, hey, this is, um, again, we go go back to our our uh, fridge or to our washing machine. It's like if I don't see a benefit, if the manufacturer or whoever manages the data cannot really tell me why this is good for me, mm-hmm. or I don't understand that, then mm-hmm. then maybe you should not do it in the first place, or or really get uh, get wrap your head around and 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 understand maybe there's a benefit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As I said, up the updates can be a great benefit. Uh, preemptive maintenance can be a great benefit. Um, I consciously connected my car with my manufacturer because I want them to have more data. I want them to produce better cars. Yeah. And that's a little bit too edged word. Maybe it goes against me because you know more about me and my driving um, and I don't know what not, right? So I also take a little bit of risk, but I, I rather, well, I took the conscious decision I, I I would support them with with the data, and they nicely ask, and they also it's a fairly transparent process. So it's not like oh your car is connected anyway, you don't know what you're doing. It's like oh this is the app, this is how you connect it, and and yes, we will use your data to improve your cars. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's true. Makes sense. So that that makes me feel a little bit more in control or a little bit more conscious of what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And that's not unimportant. So I, I, again, I, that's that's I, I love technology as you know me. I mean, I, yeah. I use all kinds of tools. Um but it's totally fair to reflect and ask those uh, maybe they are tough, but maybe those those are needed questions to ask. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm totally with you there. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thanks, Arvur. So I think that way we can sail into a very dynamic and interesting IoT future, and I, I think there's there's a lot more good to come, and also that that the stupid will weed out and and just go away. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. As yeah, as always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Coffee and Technology Podcast. To learn more about Cropster, subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media. For more educational content, visit cropster.com forward slash learn.